Hey guys, and welcome to my quarterly review of the Kubernetes release notes. So for every release of Kubernetes, I go through and I go through their release notes and bring out what I think is most important. Now, that being said, let's talk about clarifications of this channel. All opinions on this channel are that of my own, and they do not represent any company I have worked for in the past, present, or future. So with that out of the way, and they never have or never and will never be. That's not what this channel is about. This channel is for you and hopefully I provide you the information you're looking for. Another really quick warning, this video is not for newcomers. Now you're more than welcome to watch it, but I'm not going to sit and explain every piece of Kubernetes terminology that I go through because I try to hold this video to 20 minutes. And so if you're new and you're struggling with some of these, feel free to leave a comment and ask some questions, join the Discord and ask more questions there, and check out my Kubernetes playlist because I try to make plenty of Kubernetes related help videos. Let's go ahead and get into the content that you're actually here to see. Let's start with maybe the most important thing that has happened to Kubernetes, and that is it was built with Golang 1.16.1. And why is this important? Because that means you can build it natively with the M1 Mac. This actually really isn't important. I found it funny, but it is possible to do with the M1 Mac, although not all the build tools are native yet, so it's still not a real easy thing to do. But it's 1116. So let's jump into the actual really important things because the version of Go that it's used to build with isn't really that important unless if you're building a library. So what's really important is deprecations and removals. Now, if you don't know what those are, deprecations mean that it will be removed in the future, but not this release. And it's just been marked for removal, and that usually takes three releases. The removals are things that have been dep deprecated in the past and will be removed this release. So let's start with the removal. The removal, this release, is pod security policies. It was deprecated in 119 as the team realized it was not going to be able to go GA in three releases. And that meant that it had to be deprecated. And because of that, it is getting removed this release in 121. Now, I'm really sad to see pod security policies going away. Don't get me wrong. Um, they were a really great idea, but they had some inherent problems. And I have a link to the SIG auth pod security policy discussion on where they discussed what the problems were with pod security policies, how they could progress with them, and what they could do in the future. So if you're interested in that, Check that link out, read the discussion. It has a lot of really helpful information. That being said, it is being removed. So if you're depending on it, you need to move to something else. As a stopgap, there is a thing called OPA, which is the Open Policy Agent. So if you are working for compliance and you need something that fills some of the same gaps, you can do some of those same things with OPA. If you'd like a demo of OPA and, and or something like that, please leave me a comment below. Now, while I'm sad to see pod security policies go away, I'm sure something better will rise up out of its ashes and take its place. Project Phoenix, anyone? All right, so one other thing got the ax this round, and that was topology aware routing of services. Now, this one is not nearly as sad as pod security policies, and that's because it was deprecated in favor of something or some things that are built on a little bit better of a technology standpoint. So one of those things is topology aware hints that's built on top of the um, endpoint slices that we talked about in uh, the 1.20 release. So this is really exciting to see endpoint slices already being utilized for some of the things I said were exciting that it could enable in the future. We'll cover more about topology aware hints uh, a little bit later on in this video, but I wanted to move on to some uh, what I consider an unappreciated group of engineers. One of the things that has happened not only in 120 but also in 121 was a lot of work to make logging a lot better. And so there has been a lot of work on structured logging that has uh, been 
been going on and it has reached its fruition here in 121 with a lot of updates and i really wanted to give that team a uh, a cheers for the works that they have done one thing to note here though just in case you look for the kubelet server exit code that exit code was uh, originally wrong and reporting as 255 and the updates for structured logging they have fixed this kubelet error code and it is now returning a one. So if you had a piece of automation that was looking for that, you need to go and make sure to update it when you update to 121. But the logging team didn't stop just at updating to more structured logging. They went a little bit further above and beyond and added static analysis to the logging to help keep from logging secrets in Kubernetes logs. This is fantastic from a security standpoint, and it is just another way the project is maturing and cleaning up some of these things. Excellent job. So I always have a soft spot for Kubadium in my heart. It is where I cut my teeth on Kubernetes, or probably more aptly, Kubernetes cut my teeth. Because of that, I always cover a little bit of what's going on in Kubernetes. Kubeadm, and if you don't know what Kubeadm is, it's a cloud native way of standing up a Kubernetes cluster. That being said, Kubeadm released one of the biggest things I have seen from them in the last couple of years. And this is going to be that the Kubeadm init, the system that creates your cluster, will now default to system D. And why this is important is with the move to uh, container D and cryo and these systems being based off of systemd you can run them in the more deprecated c group fs but most of them most of the time it's recommended to run in systemd and if you ran them in systemd then you actually had to pass a kubeadm configuration file as well as a kubelet configuration file into your init configuration. And this means that you could also not use the command line arguments anymore. So it was a huge hassle. The kubeadm configuration file and the kubelet configuration file aren't the best documented on how to use them. And in the end, this just made kubeadm in it very painful with something like cryo. So this I see as a huge help to anybody standing up a cluster with kubeadm. Now, that being said, in version 1.22, it's also on upgrade, going to upgrade to system D. If you have a reason you need to stick with C group FS, then I suggest you check the link below as there's some instructions on how to make sure that Kubeadm does not upgrade to system D. Now, while on Kubeadm, there was one other change that was done to Kubeadm, and this was that Kubeadm completely removed the ability to use kubedns. And in fact, the developers of kubeadm are so good that they even removed thinking about using kubedns and it will just error if you even think about it. Not really, but they completely removed the ability to use kubedns as uh, your DNS solution with a kubeadm. All right, let's talk about scaling. Now, if you're like me and only work on the hottest services, you never have to worry about scaling down. But some of you guys have peak demand and then want to scale your clusters down. Prior to 121, there wasn't a whole lot of options for scaling down and mostly it would just kill the newest pod, which left your cluster in a less than optimal solution or situation. And now in 121, there are two new options. The first is a logarithmic scale down, which basically is a tries to be random. It's not perfectly random as if you get into can computers actually be random, but we're not getting into that argument. What we're going to talk about is it tries to be random and it just kills pods at, at random. The other one is a cost base. Now, I'm very interested in the cost base one, and I actually haven't gotten to play around with it yet but it's based off of a label that says how much that pod cost. Now, what I don't know here is if Kubernetes somehow manages this label for you or if you need to set up automation to label your pods with how much they cost, because if that's the case, it doesn't seem as useful or as friend easy to use or really user friendly. So I really wanna see what that is and how that might look and work. 
anyways, I think that if you don't do anything else, the logarithmic scale down makes sense as being a new standard default because the other one was just so bad. All right, let's talk a little bit about networking and then we're going to actually end on networking, but I don't know why I wanted to split it up, but I did. That's what my script says. Kind of a stopgap for gateway and gateway classes that's in the network, uh, V1, Alpha 1, I think. Those are kind of a little ways away from being mainstream and implemented in your cloud providers. So until that happens, they have actually implemented multiple load balancers in a single cluster. This gives you the ability to have multiple load balancers in your same single cluster. Now, if you're wondering why that might be interested, interesting, think private and public load balancers. So that is pretty cool. And I'm actually really interested in seeing what uh, a technology like Metal LB will do with multiple load balancers in a cluster. I actually think that some of the possibilities around this in a bare metal scenario are quite exciting. Uh, along these lines, inside of networking, there were endpoint slices graduated to stable. Now, we talked about endpoint slices in 120 about how they went to beta, and now they've graduated to stable. And not only did they graduate to stable, but endpoint slices got its first piece of technology that was built on top of that groundwork, and that was topology aware hints. So go ahead and check those out. See how you can use them instead of the now deprecated topology aware service routing, routing services. Anyways, this next one is a bit of a doozy. So I'm going to try to explain it and I'm going to try to go into enough detail that it makes sense, but not into too much detail that we're here for another 30 minutes. There has been a new memory manager created, and it's quite simple in the fact that it manages memory. But where it gets complicated is this is all around NUMA systems. If you don't know what NUMA means, NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. If you don't know what that means, basically this is motherboards with two pro or more processors. So in a NUMA system, all processors have access to all memory, but some memory is directly connected to a single processor. So if you had two processors and you had 128 gigs of memory connected to one processor and 128 gigs of memory connected to another processor, the system would have 256 gigabytes of memory. But Processor one could only access the 128 gigs quickly and efficiently. And where this gets into it is it has to hit the NUMA bus if it wants to hit the other 128 and it's further away and it takes a longer time. And what this memory manager is really looking to do is making sure that all the containers in a single pod land in the same uh, memory so that your processor doesn't have to hit this NUMA bus, making your processor and your pods much more efficient on NUMA machines. Now, I don't think that this is going to really affect any of us that uh, are an end users, but for people implementing the cloud technologies that power the Kubernetes clusters in the clouds, this is huge. You're going to get a performance benefit from optimizations like this, and this is the type of optimization optimizations you see in a maturing project. So I'm really excited about this. Sorry I took up so much time on something that probably none of you care about, but I love these really nitty fine grain details about how you're optimizing Kubernetes to run faster. But to sum this all up, the new memory manager helps with both multi and single NUMA strategies and looks to guarantee memory and huge pages available to all containers in a single pod. Now, again, the nerd side of me thinks that this is the greatest thing since 64-bit processors, but it really only affects the ultra high performance deployments and or people creating Kubernetes clusters. Have you ever had the problem where you wanted to use pod affinity, but did not know the name of the namespace ahead of time? Or you just wanted to use a selector to select a namespace like you would with a pod. Well, if that's been you, if that's ever crossed your mind why you can't do that, in Kubernetes 121, the answer is you can do it, so stop complaining. 
they have added the namespace selector so you can select a namespace just like you can a pod. Well, a namespace, not a pod. Anyways, they have also added the cross namespace affinity so that you are able to limit which namespaces you're able to select and use. So this is a really cool feature and I'm really excited to see how this is used in the future. Me personally, I've always known the namespaces and this is kind of having a well-structured Kubernetes, but I could see where this could be very useful in some GitOps sort of ways. Container Advisor or C Advisor for short and what it's commonly known as, um, the JSON metrics were removed from the kubelet. Now, this is not meaning that C-Advisor won't run or isn't still the default. What this means is that you can now bring your own if you want to. Why would you want to bring your own? Well, think VMs and Windows. So C-Advisor is very much containers and Linux. So it's only a single system. And because of that, you don't have uh, the option of doing VMs or something else. Or if you had very special needs that you need to monitor, like maybe GPUs or some resource that C Advisor doesn't provide currently. Not only does it allow you to bring your own, but it allows you to bring your own in the case of running pods and containers on a Windows system because currently that hasn't been supported. This is again just a way that the project is maturing where it gives more flexibility to people that need it. And this is really cool. So I like to see this mainly just because, not because it changes anything for anybody, unless if you run Windows, I don't. But mostly because what it really does is says this project is maturing where they can focus on these little details. One more follow up from Kubernetes 120 is the graceful node shutdown. So I know that I talked about it in 120. So if you're wanting to know uh, what graceful node shutdown does and why it's so important, go check out those notes. But graceful node shutdown is now in beta and out of alpha. So I would say, especially on dev, QA, and some of these non-production systems, go ahead and start using it. Um, it's probably good enough for those things. And I'm really excited about this. Let's now move on to the kubelet and some of the things that have changed in there. The first thing that comes to mind is the CRI or container runtime interface log rotations. So two new flags have been added to the kubelet with container log max size and container log max files. And this will manage whatever container runtime you are using and manage their log rotations. So this will allow the kubelet to manage the CRI and let your uh, container runtime know how to manage log rotations. And so this is pretty cool and added to the kubelet. Another thing that's been done, um, this is in storage, but kind of part of the kubelet, but kind of storage, but whatever. It's in the kubelet section. Um, there has been two upgrades to persistent volumes and how Kubernetes allocates storage. The very first one is there was a lot of work done to prioritize nodes based on volume capacity, making Kubernetes a lot more efficient in how it provisions persistent volumes so that it wastes less of your precious resources. This is really quite awesome. The second update that was done was one that we have needed for the last seven years. It's not a simple problem to solve, but what it is is persistent volumes were only checked. Their health was only ever checked when they were created. There was no follow-up health check and they could fail on you without really you ever knowing. And they finally added some health checks to the persistent volumes so that you know if they're there more than just when they were created. All right, so one last throwback to Kubernetes 120, and that is the fact that immutable secrets and config maps are now GA, and so feel free to use them to your heart's content. Like I said in my last video, using these can really help the efficiency of your machines, especially with things that aren't going to change. Well, they're immutable, so of course they're not going to change. So this really can help uh, really large clusters if that happens to be you. Now let's end on a dual ending. And if you think that when I mean dual ending, I mean Windows and Linux, I absolutely do not mean Windows and Linux. When I mean dual ending, I mean dual network stacks. 
If you have been wanting to run an IPv6 and IPv4 in the same cluster, today's your lucky day. In Kubernetes 1.16, we now have dual stack support for dual IPv6 and IPv4 networks. So have a blast ruining a Kubernetes cluster with dual IPv6 and IPv4 network stacks. That being said, I am going to make a video on that because I haven't actually made one of these stacks myself and I really want to try. So those were the most important things I saw. Did you see something that I didn't? Because if you did, I would love if you left a comment with something that you saw that was very important and I'll make sure to pin that so other people can see it as well. Now, while I did this overview, I highly recommend that you check out the Kubernetes release notes yourself. Hopefully this just gives you a nice overview for things that you can look forward to and look through because really they're quite long and it's hard to not fall asleep while reading them. Actually, it's been my nightly reading material for the last week. If you did not like this video, I just have one request for you. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button, stick around and see if these release notes get any better for science.